Fire, 408. 408, just 2177 in regards to the World Trade Center. What do you got for me? Ambulance and police are on their way there. I got someone in the World Trade Center. He's inside the building on the 100th. He's on the 100th. Fifth floor. Yeah, she's in the building. They want to know what to do. She's, on, she's in the building now. Smoke everywhere. Yeah, he's in the building. Inside the building. Okay, well, the, F, the fire department is on the way and ambulance is on the way and the police. Put something by the door. Just block the smoke. Try to remain where you are, okay? Hello? Did you hear her, son? She says, put something by the door to block the smoke from coming in and stay where you are. Hello? That's the phone. Can't be smoking this. Okay, give me the phone number you are calling from. Okay, oh, listen there, I understand you're upset. You must calm yourself down so you'll be able to breathe, okay? Fire department, EMS, everybody is responding. So we are aware of what's going on. Okay, you are now. What side of the building are you on? Oh. Uh, right, right, there's something going on. Okay. Calm down and try to breathe so that you'll be able to breathe just as small. When I think back at 2001 and try to, you know, set the stage for you to understand possibly what I went through, um, it's important for me to frame the era, if you will. The, you know, it's important to remember in 2001, the internet was really not really a big thing yet. Um, for example, there was no Facebook, there was no YouTube, no Instagram, no Snapchat. Um, for the most part, you had dial-up service where you had to connect to a telephone line and do the calling number to an AOL or a CompuServe or something of that nature. And many of us got sick of that noise, that tone of the modem sound. I had a cell phone. I had it for about two years. It was nothing like today's modern era smartphones, but it was uh, Nokia. It was about this tall, about that thick, had an antenna that stuck out about that much higher, and uh, you could barely text on it. You had to go like to three and four. And it represented three or four different letters. You had to kind of punch it three times or two times or whatever number you needed to get to the desired letter. So texting really wasn't a thing. So you had internet. You didn't have streaming. You didn't have Facebook and internet and YouTube and Instagram. Netflix actually was a DVD supplier. They didn't do streaming online. They were doing DVDs in the mail, like Blockbuster did. So technology-wise, that's important because from a social network, what was happening at the time, you couldn't get information out. There was a big black void, and it was hard to get information what was happening for the day. Let me step back. I was out in New York to do a corporate team building event for Chase Manhattan Bank. And they had retained us to do a team building session with 50 of the new um, branch managers. Now at the time, my company EBL was all about corporate team building. That's what I did. I did groups as small as four. I had done groups as large as a thousand. I was in New York, San Francisco, Alaska, Florida, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, you know, Chicago, Dallas, you name it, I was there. I was going to be the team building motivational speaker, and that was my career, okay? You know, Tony Robbins, look out, I'm coming for you. But anyways, that was what I did. I traveled, I did corporate team building events, I did uh, learning instruments. My favorite one was called the decision making styles instrument, which helped people profile how they reacted in certain times of collaboration versus crises, uh, silo teams versus intact teams. It was really kind of a, a unique instrument. 
And I would couple that with an upfront needs assessment with an experiential team building seminar that had them interacting with each other with that instrument. It was really a, it really proved to be a powerful component for our learning and really was helping us get a lot of referrals. So that's why I was up in New York. And I had actually been to New York prior to that because I was on Bloomberg television for an interview once. And uh, been, a team, uh, been in New York numerous times for team building. So I felt kind of comfortable in the city. I didn't mind the travel, I didn't mind the people and the busy and the hustle and the bustle. So I flew out actually on a Saturday from Milwaukee to Newark and then Newark, New Jersey, I drove in to, um, into New York because I like to get there a day early and prepare and I had to get a couple supplies. So I needed to afford time to do that. And luckily I was able to get my supplies early, which actually gave me that Sunday off. So somewhere in my house, I've got pictures from, we went, I went down to Wall Street District and took pictures of the bull statue. Um, I found Trump Tower. This is before all the politics of the day when Trump was cool, actually. A billionaire, everybody wanted to make money like Trump. It was a big deal. Um, saw the Jefferson Monuments, um, and then also took the ferry out and did the Statue of Liberty tour, saw Ellis Island, and I have a picture looking back at New York from the uh, Statue of Liberty and the Twin Towers and the whole skyline, it was just blue sky, not a cloud in the sky, absolute gorgeous sunny day. Wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold, it was just perfect. I thought, wow, can't get any better than this. So then on the two day training, I started off with Monday. I did the seminar with the bankers and it was uneventful. I mean, nothing went wrong. It went all according to plan. The group was really engaged. I was really clicking it with them. Um, we had to see a good collaboration and rapport started. They were taking to the information very well. They were engaged. They wanted to be there. It was fun. And they just had great personalities. I mean, that really makes a, a session was when the group engages and has fun with it. It just, you know, positivism breeds positivism. It really does. So I left day one really excited. So, you know, I was there. I was in my suit and my dress shoes. So I walked back about five or six blocks to uh, club quarters where I was staying. Now, you gotta understand a city block in New York, the old district down there, is really kind of short. If you think of a traditional city block in a new more modern built city, one city block would almost equivalent to about four or five those smaller compressity blocks in New York down there in the Wall Street area where I was at in the World Trade Center. So to say I was four or five blocks away really was like one or two conventional city blocks from my lodging to where we were holding the event. And then from the event, I had later gone back, we were only about seven or eight city blocks from where we were at to the World Trade Center. And I had visited the World Trade Center. Actually, I was down there that Monday morning and was just looking up at the structures and the way it was architecture and I thought, wow, that building was cool. You know, you look up and see it swaying a little bit and kind of, ooh, get your stomach turning. So I was doing the New York experience. I was taking it in, doing my job and having a fun, fun time with it. So that was one day before, that was September 10th. Everything was fine. I was having a good time. On the morning of September 11th, the morning was, again, uneventful. I got up, got breakfast. I packed my clothes. I got dressed in my suit and my tie and jacket and the shoes. and the, I mean, I was dressed to the tees. And packed my suitcase, went down to the lobby, 
checked out because I was going to get my car later that day and make a later flight out from Newark. And right when I was walking out the door, I heard what sounded like a large empty dump truck that hits a big pothole and just goes, ka -chunk! And it echoed so loud in the street that it seemed like it was right up there in front of my face. But I looked around and I didn't see any truck. I didn't think anything about it. So I came down a few steps, walked around the corner, and then noticed, you know, thousands of people all walking around. But then that's when I noticed everybody was looking up at the Trade Center and they were all pointing. And I looked up and sure enough, there was the Trade Centers and black billowing smoke was coming out of one of the towers. And I went, oh my God, I thought, you know, one of those tourist planes must have uh, inadvertently crashed into the towers. Because when I was out there on uh, the Statue of Liberty tour on Sunday, they have helicopters and planes buzzing and looping all day long, doing guided air, air tours and so forth. So I thought it was a, either a guided plane or a guided helicopter tour hit the building and had, a, had an explosion. I mean, we could hear some sirens in the distance, but people for the most part just kind of kept milling around doing our thing. Now, as I was walking from my hotel to, the, to my building, and I looked up with everybody else watching the smoke, I noticed paper in the sky. And I grabbed some pieces. I mean, it looked like a ticker tape parade. But there was no special events going on. So I grabbed some pieces that were falling. It was all over in the sky. And I grabbed a couple pieces. And I looked at it, and it actually had a person's name to so-and-so from, and then the edge was all burnt. And that's when it kind of dawned on me the first time, this memo was just on someone's desk. And that tower, and it was on fire. I hope that person's okay. But they probably weren't. That was the first sinking gut shot I got, thinking, this could be bad. So I walked the three or four blocks and got to Chase, Chase One Plaza, where we were at. And I think it was the 28th floor, because they had, it was an open, open uh, meeting room, and you walked into the lobby, and then there was another interior staircase that took you to the 29th floor. So you came in at the 28th, had to go up a staircase at the 29th, and that was our meeting room. So I remember coming in, oh boy, 8.30, 8.20 in the morning, and I was going to get set up for the day. So when I came in the lobby, there were people milling around in the lobby, watching TV, and it was kind of normal. I went to the room, I set up my belongings, and then I came back down to watch what was going on. You know, I might have the time here, I could do back 9.20. It's funny, you think you remember those facts, but you don't. And the other facts you think you want to forget, you remember. So I came into the lobby, I went upstairs, I went up to the 29th floor on that shared staircase to the 28th and 29th floor, set up, and then my group wasn't coming. And I didn't know why they weren't coming to the class. So it was like 9.30ish now, 9.20, I think it was. So I went down to the lobby, and when I went down to the lobby, I was asking my group, come on, let's go, let's go, let's get started. And they said, no, we can't. They're talking about a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. And for me, being a visitor to the city, I wasn't in tune to the fact that people in my group had 
fiancés and husbands and wives and moms and dads and uncles and aunts that were working in those buildings. And forget it, they weren't going to train. They were focused on if their loved ones were out of there. So no sooner did I go back up to the room, wait a few more minutes, I came back down to decide if I was going to cancel the, the training for the day or not, and there I was watching CNN, had about 40 or 50 people around the TV set, and here comes the second plane and hits the building. I was instantly surrounded by screams, people falling to the floor, praying to God, chaos. It was apparent that we were under an attack at that point. And we didn't know what was next. It was really apparent we were under attack and we didn't know what was next. I, I was in disbelief. I didn't know quite what to do. Except we just watched TV. Watch TV. Watch TV. I didn't know what to do. We just, everybody stood around and just watched that TV. We were glued to it, watching the plane explode them rerunning it over and over, looping that video. People are trying to figure out where it was because they had other family in adjacent buildings. Because the World Trade Center was a conglomerate of buildings, not just two. It was like a whole compound of buildings around it as well. It was horrific. And I didn't know what was going to happen. So I called my wife to give her a heads up call that I was safe. And they started talking about were there more planes? Because he started to hear on the news, there was the Pentagon, there was the other one that came down in Pennsylvania. People were getting scared. I was getting scared. But they said, okay, we're done, we're not training. I knew that, it was obvious. So I went up, grabbed my suitcase and stuff in the room. I just left all my training materials. I wasn't gonna try to shuttle those home in this mess. And uh, I checked in with my liaison with Chase. They said, yeah, we're done, no problem. And I hit the elevator and I went down. When I got to the ground floor, the lobby attendants actually told me, no, 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 go back up where you were. The streets are chaotic. And I looked out through the, the windows on the, ground, on the ground level and it was just people running and screaming and people going every which way. It was just hectic. So I elected to go back up to the floor and just kind of wait it out there. When I got back up on the elevator after going down and trying to get out and just said, no, no, go back up. When I got back on the elevator, got back on the 20th floor, we just all sit there and watch TV. And then the talk started to be, are the buildings going to collapse? And they started to compare it to the 94 parking garage explosion, structurally what happened then to what could have happened now. And it was all the talk about possible collapse, possible collapse, possible collapse. Where we were at, it wasn't so much the collapse that people were focused on, but how it was going to collapse. They didn't know if it was going to implode and go down, which we later saw that it did. But they were concerned about a hinge fall. Now again, I was only seven, eight blocks away, short, small blocks. We were definitely within the the fall zone, if that tower would have hinged over, it would have struck our building. And that was a concern. I 
and they thought, you know, we need to get you out of here again. So this time, it was a forced evacuation from the building. They called it, everybody go down. But this time, the elevators were out of function. I don't know why, but they just weren't working. We had fire people in our building. They were walking around. And uh, but we had to go down 28 sets of 28 st flights of stairs as we were in our corporate suits, ties, dresses, high heels, whatever you're wearing. That's what you are doing your stair your stairs in. Again, we got to the ground floor, and the fire department then had people down there saying, "No, go back up where you were." get off the streets, keep the streets open right now. So we got in the elevators, which they were letting us go back up the elevators, but we couldn't use them coming down. So we go back up to the 28th floor, we're on the floor again, and that's when the collapse happened. When we started to watch that tower come down on TV, It sunk in that people were dying. I felt so, so much despair at that moment. People around me were screaming and crying because they had loved ones in that building that were dying. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. And what I wasn't prepared for, as the tower came down, well, everybody in America, and around the world, I believe, was watching the tower collapse, is we heard the sound. We had a rumbling that our building was shaking and we didn't know if it was hinging or how it was falling and we were prepared that we were going to get hit by the building coming down. I felt for my life. I was praying. It was... Excuse me. It was 20 years ago, and it was like it was yesterday. But we were actually glad it went straight down because we knew we weren't going to get hit. And we felt guilty about feeling that way. I felt bad. And there's nothing I could do. I was helpless. And right when I was starting to comprehend, the window just went black. Because as the dust and debris was going down between the buildings and the streets, we could see it on TV. You look at the window, you can see it coming through the coming down the street from the window, and it just went black. You could not see out the window. The sound, the shaking, the realization of the pain and the death that was occurring was just overwhelming. And yet, we knew nothing to do. We didn't know what to do. There was nothing we could do. We sat there in horror as they started to discuss the collapse of the second tower. And everything we felt and lived through for the first tower and our thoughts was not going to be more people dying. 
again, was it going to hinge and hit us? And the guilt I felt for thinking, thank goodness it didn't hit us on the first tower was coming back to me again because I didn't want anybody to get hurt or die. But here I am thinking, the Lord, I lived and somebody else died. I, it wasn't me. I mean, just. I later learned that they call that survivor's guilt. Why someone else died and you didn't. And I understand it. The <clears throat> the second tower then did fall. It collapsed down. And again, on TV, but we were having it, the sound, the shaking of our building, the ground, it was like an earthquake when it hit. It just shook everything. And when it when the buildings come down, <clears throat> it ruined all the infrastructure underneath it as well. All the water lines, electrical power, gas lines, subway, everything that was sub subterrain below the street or below the subway, it all got destroyed as well when the buildings came down and crushed it. Now, I think that's probably why the elevators, they didn't want us using them because they didn't know if they were going to be powered on or off and they didn't want us stuck or stranded. But now, we were underneath the second evacu uh, evacuation order to get out of our building. So it was into the stairwell, down again, 28 flights of stairs. Now, this time... When we came out of the, the stairwell, there was just gray haze and dust everywhere. And the, the, the glass on our first floor, the building, that were all on the Trade Center side had blown out from all the air blast and the debris flying down the streets. Whatever the the the, the 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 windows are broken out, so we were in clear air. Open the door; it was just dust, and there's about an inch of gray dust everywhere on the lobby floor on everything. It was like walking on the moon, kind of gray, powdery dust. And at that point, the streets were filled with people running and screaming, and horns blaring, and yelling, and people covered in dust. And you couldn't really hardly see. You, you couldn't figure out your direction. And they told us to leave, but yet we were stopped at the doors by the fire department saying, hold in place shelter where you are. And I guess later on I realized, well, the buildings were down now. The fear of other buildings being hit wasn't as great, and they wanted us to hold where we were at so we wouldn't be in the streets getting confused and lost and part of that chaos out there. So they actually had us go back up to our floor again. Now, I remember, what's going on? You know, we've been evacuated twice. We've been told to come back up twice. So there we were on the floor. The buildings had collapsed. And what we later learned is they had turned off all the air ducts and outside air to create a, an atmosphere bubble in our building. And that's where they wanted us to stay put because they didn't want us to breathe all that smoke. They're actually looking out for us, and they want us to stay put. So with that atmosphere bubble of the building, we were still having clear air. Even though you looked at the windows, you couldn't see through the windows. 
the the thought was the smoke would clear quick enough because when they when the buildings came down the smoke went everywhere but it was also drifting with the wind enveloping our building but that didn't last long you can start to see some smoke kind of at the top of the ceiling around the lights. And over time, that got thicker and thicker and thicker. To where when you would walk up and down hallways, if you stood up straight, your face is in smoke, you couldn't see it in the hallway, you are having to bend and look underneath of it. So Chase had some uh, silk handkerchiefs that they had and they were handing them out, we were wetting them in the sink, and then putting them on our faces, filters, not to breathe the smoke. Well, it came a point where they said you have to leave, because now the smoke was down a couple feet off the floor, and that was it, leave. And this time, another 28 stairs down, into the gray dust, walk over the broken glass, out the windows, out the doors, you were on your own. Now, a lot of the crowds of the street have already cleared out. We had emergency people still coming in. So you had firefighters and police officers kind of milling around. And as I was going back to the hotel, in my mind, to try to get my room back for the night, because I, I knew by now the airplanes had all been grounded. I wasn't going to fly home that night. So I tried to get my hotel figured out and get back to my hotel. So I'm back to the hotel, got my room again, went to my room, but there's no water, there's no electricity. So I had to walk up those, I think it was like a fourth or fifth floor there. Get to my room, change out of my suit, get to my street clothes. <clears throat> By about that time, they were saying, hey, anybody who's hungry, come on down to the lobby. The kitchen's going to throw together some six-foot subs, pitch in five or ten bucks, and you can just kind of eat what you need to eat. So that was lunch. Kind of the community, six-foot, couple six-foot subs tossed together. So... That was uh, it was I was appreciated for sure. I was hungry, and it was nice to see that camaraderie of support of each other. It was just we were all in this together. We were all going to survive it together now. So I knew that we didn't have water. I knew we weren't going to have food service that night. So I went on a mission to walk out in the streets and try to find, you know, some kind of restaurant or deli. I could get some sandwiches and some drinks for the night and then maybe something for breakfast the next morning. But as you're walking around, you know, you're walking in two to three inches of this gray dust. And you're trying not to breathe it but you're still in this plume of smoke that's just enveloping everything. And the further you walked away, the dust got thinner and the smoke got thinner as well. But I remember seeing just things that surprised me. I mean, they were deserted hot dog stands. They were deserted pretzel stands. I thought, oh, I'll get a pretzel. I mean, they're in there, they're cooking. There's no one here. But then there's the carousel, and the pretzels are rotating on the carousel, and they all look good and tasty, but on every top of the pretzel was about an inch of gray dust. Now, a morbid thought, and I'm sorry to say this, but it was in my mind, is that that dust most likely contained people. So I didn't want to eat in it. 
I didn't want to walk in it. That thought hit me, and it just really made me think about what was going on again. So I kept walking down the street, and now there's taxis in the middle of the road, doors open, abandoned taxis, abandoned pretzel stands, abandoned hot dog stands, abandoned stores. And it was like, you know, we didn't have zombie apocalypses back then for TV shows, but that's what it was like. Now you're in New York City where the streets are usually flooded with thousands of people, horns, taxis, whatever, subways underneath your feet, you could hear them. It's a dead silence. No one for as long as the eye could see. Dust and abandoned cars. It was just surreal. And I thought, what am I doing here? And I recalled seeing on TV, everybody was walking north to get out of the area, the lower, the lower island area. So I decided to go back to the hotel, grab my stuff and try to get to my rental car that was actually about another 12 blocks away in Battery Park. So I was walking back to the hotel and I saw this guy and he was pouring out his water bottle. Now, I was out looking for food and water. And this guy's pouring it away. And I said, well, hey, what are you doing? I'll take the water. I'm thirsty. And he goes, no, no, no. And he's pouring it out. He started scooping the dust into his, uh, his water bottle. And I said, what are you doing? And he replied, do you know how much this is going to be worth on eBay? And I don't know what happened, but something snapped in me, and I hauled off and punched him. I thought that was so morbid. I was horrified that he was going to try to gain profit on other people's sorrow and dismay. And right then, a firefighter was watching and came over and asked me why I had punched him. And I said, this guy is taking the dust for eBay. And at that point, he looked at the guy that I knocked on the ground, and he just shook his head, and then he left me alone. We went on our way. So I turned and I walked away, and I don't know what happened to that guy. I hope he didn't get rewarded by selling it on eBay. So I was mad. I was sad. I felt desperate. I didn't feel safe. In the meantime, you couldn't get a phone call out. So while you're all focused on survival mode, food, water, shelter, you know, I also noticed my phone doesn't work. Because when the first tower came down, that was where the cell phone signal came from, was the top tower of the antenna. So we got no food, no water, no sewer, no electricity, no cell phone service. I mean, it was the, it was the Stone Age. <laughs> and I was right in the middle of it. Now, I don't mean to make light of it. I was glad to be alive. And I know a lot of people lost their lives. And I feel for those people. And I was horrified when it happened, and this day I feel sick to my stomach when I think about it. 